Excuse me, little dog. Oh. Hi, guys. Well, it is a cold autumn night. We might have frost, literally have frost on the pumpkin tonight. Uh, it will be the first time I have seen frost in... Uh, is this camera? Yeah. Man, these damn cameras. I have not seen frost on my pumpkin in, I'm thinking, about a year and a half. But uh, we're getting to that time here. It is an exciting Saturday night here at Bugs in a Jar Farm. Imagine that. My second Saturday night as a officially an old fart here on Saturday. August, August, listen to me, yeah, I wish, October 5th, 2024, so, uh, I have been dealing with gas-sucking trucks all day, since I, since I woke up this morning until now, I have spent my entire day dealing with this goddamn gas-sucking truck, uh, Anyway, so now that darkness has descended, and I don't need to look at that fucking truck. Uh, w one more minute. Your old uh, fossil fuel fool and chronicler of the collapse. We're going to go over, as I've kind of threatened to past couple of days, we're going to go over to sub-Saharan Africa this evening. Uh, for, for, for a couple of reasons, we're heading over to the shithole country of uh, Uganda, which is getting ready to be a much bigger shithole country than it already is. I have actually had the pleasure of being in Uganda, and it was a beautiful uh, country, at least back in 1972. I was one of the last white people in Uganda before Idi Amin ran, ran all the white folks out, but it sure was pretty when I was there. Uh, so I remember Uganda fondly, but we're going to go and actually hear from a sub-Saharan African living in the shithole country of Uganda. We're going to get it straight from a sub-Saharan African. Uh, but part of the reason I want to is because there seems to be con some confusion that I am so clueless that I am only blaming sub-Saharan Africans for their absolute failure to keep their peckers in their pants and not letting their knickers down, that the only reason sub-Saharan Africa is such a shithole is because sub-Saharan Africans can't stop, uh, you know, breeding like maggots. But uh, I, I do want you to understand that I do understand that it takes it takes a village to make a shithole. It really takes a planetary village to make a shithole. So what the sub-Saharan Africans are working with is the shithole that honky and more and more China uh, has made, uh, the mess they have made out of the place. Anybody who wants to understand uh, how a shithole is made, if you have never read Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, I think he wrote that in 1914. Uh, Still the best work I have ever found about how sub-Saharan Africa got to be such a shithole before it wasn't uh, overpopulated. But anyway, enough rambling. We're going to, god damn it, we're going to pick this tick off my dog. This dog is covered with ticks. Sancho... You know, how many people in their YouTube uh, videos pick ticks off their, off their dogs? 
Good Lord. You know, it's weird. As soon as the weather gets cold, is when these goddamn ticks really start coming out. Yes, yeah, little dog. I know it. It's disgusting. Let me get rid of this tick. I'm, I'm not going to tell you how I am getting rid of the tick. You can uh, use your imagination to figure out how I am getting rid of this tick. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't you love to know? Anyway, now that we've gotten the tick out of the way, the blood-sucking parasite of the day, let's hear from uh, Stephen Kamugasa. This is in medium.com originally published in the New Climate. Okay, and Stephen Kamugasa is going to explain to us why Ugandan oil spells environmental ecocide. Yes, while my country smells riches, the evidence from other African nations is that oil turns regions into sacrifice zones. <clears throat> Take it away, Stephen. It is regarded as ingratitude to look a gift horse in the mouth. When something good comes to us entirely as a gift, it is not for us to C-A-V-I-L. I have never in my entire life, in 65 years, I have never heard the word C-A-V-I-L. Ever. Once. Must be a Ugandan word. When something good comes to us entirely as a gift, it is not for us to cavil at it, but to accept it. One such gift is the hundreds of billions of dollars worth of crude oil, crude oil located in the Albertine Basin in western Uganda. Rather than join in the revelry at the prospect of unimaginable riches for Uganda, I cannot help but look at this particular gift horse in the mouth, and I don't like what I see. This horse has not only bad teeth, it also has breath that stinks to high heaven. Lessons from other oil-rich African countries show that the high-stakes world of crude petroleum is like the boy's butterfly. It is pretty sport to chase it, but bruise its wings with an overzealous grasp, and it is nothing but a bitter disappointment. We get to hear some sub-Saharan African cliches for a change. Okay, uh, Stephen is getting you ready to make a no-shit Sherlock prediction for the future. <clears throat> I predict that in the not too distant future, the breathtakingly beautiful regions of western Uganda will be reduced to nothing but an ecocide, a sacrifice zone, exceeding by far the sacrifice zone of Cobway in Zambia. There you go. Uh, I don't know if Cobway, Zambia looks anything like Asheville, North Carolina or not right now. But first, let's clear up a few technical points by first defining ecocide and sacrifice zone so that everyone knows exactly what I'm talking about. You know, Chris Hedges has written a lot about sacrifice zones. Okay, first, what then is ecocide? 
an independent expert panel that met in 2021 under the auspices of the Stop Ecocide Ain't Gonna Happen Foundation reportedly reached a consensus to define ecocide as an international crime. Ecocide, according to the panel, is defined as, quote, unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that those acts have a substantial likelihood of causing severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment, close quote. And of course, this means that every time uh, I fill up my gas-sucking truck with gas, I am committing ecocide. Uh, every time uh, that somebody in sub-Saharan Africa or anywhere else cannot resist keeping their pecker in their pants or not letting their eco or not letting their ecos down their uh, their uh, whatever they call those things uh, panties or knickers uh, m meaning wh whenever anybody breeds they are committing ecocide anybody who breeds and breeders are the number one ecocidal maniacs on the planet Anybody who owns a car, I commit ecocide every day of my life because I'm a car owner. Every time I turn on this electric heater, okay, every time I turn on this heater, I am, well, I'm not committing an unlawful act, but I am committing a wanton act committed with knowledge that, you know, turning on the heater or filling up my gas sucking truck with gas, or well, I don't know about breeding because I'm not a breeder. I know that turning on this heater will have a substantial likelihood of causing severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment, yet I'm turning on the heater, yet I'm gassing up my gas-sucking truck. Okay, the, 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 the fact that we are humans is that every one of us are committing ecocide every time we wake up in the morning. Anyway, I'm getting off track. Let's get back to Stephen's uh, rant here. <coughs> I do not know if Stephen is a breeder or not. He never mentions uh, overpopulation or population anywhere in his fine essay. The panel went above and beyond by providing definitions for certain key terms or phrases within the definition, including the terms wonton, I thought wonton, I thought that was a Chinese soup, wonton, severe, widespread, long-term, and environmental, to help prevent any misunderstandings, we will restrict ourselves to just three for the purposes of our case. Wanton, severe, and widespread. Thus, the panel defined wanton, W-A-N-T-O-N, not as a Chinese soup, but as the reckless disregard for damage that would be clearly excessive in relation to the social and economic benefits anticipated. Severe defined as damage that involves very serious adverse changes, disruption, or harm to any element of the environment, including grave impacts on human life or natural, cultural, or economic resources, and finally, 
widespread as damage that extends beyond a limited geographic area crosses state boundaries or is suffered by an entire ecosystem or species or a large number of human beings. All right. So anyone who has not read Chris Hedges, what is the definition of a sacrifice zone? Otherwise known as a shithole, well, a shithole country, a shithole city, you know what I'm saying. A sacrifice zone is also a recognized term according to the Climate Reality Project. A sacrifice zone is defined as, quote, populated areas with high levels of pollution and environmental hazards thanks to nearby toxic or polluting industrial facilities. These areas are called sacrifice zones because the health and safety of people in these communities is being effectively sacrificed for the economic gains and prosperity of others, close quote. The primary cause of locations turning into sacrifice zones is mostly the lack of appropriate government regulation. Huh. The fact that local populations in the aforementioned locations frequently do not have the means to either influence lawmakers to take action or have access to information about the impact pollution is having on their region exacerbates this lack of regulation. It means that the human rights, not to mention the non-humans, uh, it means that the human rights of the affected populations are hostage to fortune their rights to life, their rights to health, and their rights to a clean, healthy, and sustainable, sustainable environment cannot be guaranteed. It is impossible to reconcile their fundamental right to a healthy environment with absolutely horrific environmental conditions that characterize sacrifice zones. The worst example of a sacrifice zone on the African continent is Kabwe in Zambia. Can you imagine this shit all? Kabwe was home to a lead mining and smelting operation for almost 90 years, starting in 1906, while the country was still under colonial British rule. Between 1925 and 1974, the mine was controlled by Anglo-American South Africa, a subsidiary of Anglo-American PLC. It is believed that at this time, as the video below clearly shows, and then he links you over to a YouTube video, the company neglected to safely manage the mine, turning Cobway into a sacrifice zone and severely contaminating the surrounding area with lead, harming locals for decades afterward. This has caused the neurological system fertility, the fertility and internal organization, internal organs to sustain severe and irreversible physical harm. Well, as I say, you know, every cloud does have a silver lining. So let's give a big hand 
to the Cobway lead mine for uh, for harming the fertility of Zambians. Anyway, lead exposure, even at low concentrations, can have an adverse effect on a child's brain development, lowering IQ, changing behavior, behavior patterns like short attention spans and increased antisocial conduct and decreasing educational attainment. Well, maybe that explains why Sub-Saharan Africans can't keep their peckers in their goddamn pants. There's all that lead poisoning. <clears throat> Returning to the much-awaited Ugandan oil, nothing exposes the harshness of this situation like light does. The Uganda Oil Project Fuels Rights Climate and Environment Harms Report was released on September 2nd this year by Climate Rights International. It said, quote, serious and widespread human rights abuses, environmental damage, and massive and unnecessary future carbon emissions should lead banks, financial institutions, and insurers to decline to provide further support for the Kingfisher Oil Project operated by the Chinese National Oil Corporation in Uganda. The report went on to add, quote, Dozens of interviewees accused the Ugandan People's Defense Force of responsibility for forced eviction, destruction of fishing boats, violence, and creating a climate of fear aimed at protecting the Kingfisher Oil Project and intimidating local residents, activists, and environmental defenders opposed to the project. Moreover, the report said, quote, an analysis by the Climate Accountability Institute concluded that the entire oil and gas project would produce around 379 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions over 25 years. Peak annual emissions would be more than double the current annual emissions of Uganda and Tanzania combined. Like all new oil and gas projects, its development is incompatible with the Paris Agreement's one and a half degree warming target, yeah, and a livable planet, close quote. These findings are consistent with my recent podcast interview with Dr. Helen Epstein regarding her book, Another Fine Mess, America, Uganda, and the War on Terror, where you really get down and start connecting all of these dots. In response to one of my inquiries concerning the risks associated with oil in Uganda, Dr. Epstein answered, quote, Uganda is forging ahead with the East African crude oil pipeline which will funnel oil from the west of Uganda and eventually from eastern Congo and South Sudan, as well as via Tanzania to the coast. And in the process, it will destroy precious ecosystems, kill off wildlife, and displace thousands of people. There is a war in eastern Congo right now 
that few people know about. But a lot of people there are being killed in it, and it is partly about oil, which Uganda is trying to control. All that oil is also going to release tons and tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which will accelerate global warming and create more hurricanes, wildfires, deadly tornadoes, and droughts, and raise sea levels, close quote. But now for the hopium. Yes, we got some hopium. But Dr. Epstein went on to add, there is a really inspiring campaign to stop, just stop the East African crude oil pipeline and to target particularly the companies involved with it, including the multinational Total Energies, which is an American-French, largely multinational company, the Chinese National Overseas Oil Company, the Standard Bank of South Africa, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, and the Sumitomo Mitsui Bank of Japan. Everyone needs to join the movement against that pipeline, not just to save Uganda, but to save the world. Yes, really, everyone must help where they can and do what they can. I think joining a campaign like Stop the East African Crude Oil Pipeline would be a great place to start. Anyone can do that. You. Anyone listening to this can do this. Join a demonstration. Become informed. That's what I'm trying to do is inform you. Try to convince the people around you to care about this issue. Try to convince the people around you to care about a pipeline crossing Uganda. Uh, it is something that affects everyone, especially the people of the future, wherever they live. It's really an existential problem. It's absolutely crucial, close quote. Back to Stephen. Normally, I would not be critical of a gift horse, certainly not one that promises riches with the potential to transform the fortunes of a poor country such as Uganda. But Uganda is not your ordinary run-of-the-mill African country. There you go. Indeed, no country has ever lost anything by keeping track of expenses and understanding its own financial situation. Numerous African countries have suffered greatly as a result of initiatives that were encouraged by speculative thinking, encouraged by a total disregard for their own needs. Well, that's why it's called Total Oil Company, and fueled by complete ignorance of their actual financial situation relative to the rest of the world. Such countries are master self-saboteurs and Uganda is chief among them. Uganda is a master at self-sabotage ever since General Museveni seized power in 1986. I guess that he seized power from Idi Amin. His successive governments have, un, have outdone themselves in, provi in presiding over a bonfire of destruction of independent institutions which are essential to good governments. He has reduced his country to what we can best describe as a 
Proculator's Felicity. A Proculator's Felicity with no meaningful regulatory regime. The country is lost to thieves. All elements that constitute the independent expert panel's definition of ecocide are satisfied when it comes to Uganda's proposed oil projects. It is no exaggeration that were these projects to go ahead, many regions in Uganda would be reduced to sacrifice zones. It is in conceivable that any of these big global corporations which are vying against each other for a slice of the Ugandan oil pie will take responsibility for the coming environmental catastrophe. Due to the enormous power of these corpor the, the, these corporations command, they functioned and continue to do so in a neo-colonialist way during General Museveni's nearly 40-year vice-like rule over Uganda, disregarding the needs of the local African population and the environment in their fervent pursuit of financial gain. It begs the question, who owns Uganda? The question has been asked for several years, but it becomes all the more pertinent in light of the ongoing Uganda oil and the East African crude oil pipeline saga. I realize that I'm talking to myself, but I'm going to go ahead and finish this out. The answer to the above question may lie in the first president of Ghana, Kwame Krumah's thesis on neo-colonialism, which I paraphrase here. The essence of neo-colonialism is that the state that is subject to it is, in theory, independent and has all the outward trappings of international sovereignty. In reality, its economic system and thus its political policy are directed from outside, can you say, from all of these banks in China. The result of neo-colonialism is that foreign capital is used for exploitation rather than for the development of the less developed parts of the world. Investment under neo-colonialism increases rather than decreases the gap between the rich and the poor countries of the world." Close quote. If the thesis is correct, Uganda is, for all intents and purposes, a colony of large global capital rather than a sovereign nation in any real sense. Uh, that is exactly what it is. Uh, and then I will uh, end up where I picked up last night. After all of that, then we get this. The overwhelming evidence of climate change puts all of us at unimaginable risk. The issue we must all ask ourselves is how to mitigate the repercussions of what is still to come. Supporting a motion submitted to the International Criminal Court asking for ecocide to be recognized as a crime could be the answer. By making ecocide a crime, Yes, uh, started the process of, of changing how the world responds to environmental degradation and climate breakdown. How about amending 
international law to include ecocide on the list of crimes along with war crimes and genocide. Well, you see how well uh, the international courts on war crimes and genocide are doing. Just take a tour around the planet. If successful, if successful, the change could allow for the prosecution of individuals who have brought about environmental destruction, such as the heads of large polluting companies or heads of state. We would do well to support this proposal. Who knows? Maybe this will prevent the impending disaster in the Pearl of Africa, Uganda. We must act now. There you go. Thank you, Stephen Kamugasa, for all of that leading up to that ain't gonna happen. Uh, so I guess we can uh, prosecute Joe Biden uh, as a ecocidal criminal uh, if he's not a war criminal uh, and a uh, genocidal maniac. Uh, I, I, I guess maybe it is overseeing as a head of state uh, pumping out more fossil fuels uh, last year than in any year in American history. Does that qualify Joe Biden as guilty of the crime of ecocide? I say it does. And you better believe uh, that Kamala Harris or Donald Trump will step right in line but, but behind uh, Joe Biden and go right on committing the crime of ecocide, but I have to go <coughs> commit the crime of ecocide by firing up some uh, propane and, and heating up some sort of factory farm dead fellow earthling so I can get out there and enjoy it while I still can but I need to turn on this heater because it's getting cold enjoy practicing ecocide while you still can I'm sure practice will make perfect bye guys This little dog, I'm trying to get you interested in the Ugandan oil pipeline. Pancho, are you interested in the Uganda oil pipeline? What can you do, Sancho Panza, to stop the Uganda oil pipeline? Oh, Jesus, we're so fucked.